you take your Bibles this morning, let's go over to James chapter 3. James chapter 3. This morning I want to continue on with our social media. And I want to talk about our checklists. Social media, the checklist, the only one you'll ever need. You know, when you think about social media, talking about Jesus is easier than it ever has been, thanks to social media. But so is falling into the trap of a cruel, condescending talk. How can a Christian on social media draw closer to Christ instead of pushing them away? Social media can be a great way to laugh, encourage others, and discuss current issues. However, many times posts can be distasteful and mean-spirited. As Christians, we should be careful and thoughtful in posting and liking articles and mimes. It says something about you. I saw a a lot of few funny posts this week because uh, people are complaining about snow and cold and and, uh, my American friends are all posting what they're thankful for. So this morning I thought I'd wake up and I'd post something as a Canadian I'm thankful for, remote start. You know, when when I first moved back home and 14 years ago, I thought, why would I ever need to pay $200 for that? And now they're less than $79. It's amazing how things go down. But $79 is a lazy man's way of warming the car up for the wife. You know, it doesn't matter with me if the car's warm or not, but my women, you know, they get out and they're all like, whew. So, you know, you hit that button twice and your car honks and there you go, it turns on. And, you know, as I get older, maybe it's nicer or something. But uh, I wrote that this morning. I'm thankful. So I had a few people write to me and says, what's cold? And so that was their version of saying, it's nice and warm where we're at. And so it's a good way to keep in touch with people. And I've been able to keep in touch with people from my university, college days, high school. And it's nice, but there is a lot of garbage on social media. And you really got to be careful. You know, the Bible says, be careful what we see. Be careful what we think, what we ponder on. And you know, the old mind goes garbage in, garbage out. The more you see, the more you hear It is amazing how much the devil just kind of, it's like a barb. It just kind of hooks there. And all of a sudden, it comes out. And it's like, where did that come from? It's from the years of seeing things and watching things and listening to things that really affects us. And you know, James chapter 3 deals with our tongue. And it is a little member that sometimes slips. And things come out and you say, I wish I hadn't said that. But also we got to be careful because our mind is controlling of the tongue and our fingers. And sometimes we get in the heat of the moment and we want to let someone know on Facebook how you really disapprove of them. And it's best. I want you to think of something and I'm going to be referring to a lot of it during the message. The word think. The word think. It applies to social media and it applies to our speech. Why think? It's an acronym. Think means, is it true for the T? Is it helpful for the H? Is it inspiring for the I? Is it necessary for the N? Is it kind? Think. Is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? If we're to apply that in our daily life, think You know, my dad's favorite saying to me, I wish you would think before you act. How many kids never think, we just do. And he always say, you know what, that's what God gave you a brain. And I always just say, when God was handing out brains, I thought he said trains that got to the end of the line. So I missed it. You know, and this is where we don't think. And we're like, what were you thinking? You ever heard that before? I wasn't. We acted before we think. And this is where I want to teach you this morning from the Word of God how we ought to think in social media. Because you know what I'm finding out, and politicians are finding out, and public officials, it's never really deleted. And I wish it was, but it's not in case. But think about one aspect. God never deletes anything. He, is, he says every idle word is recorded. What is an idle word? I've pondered that for years. But social media is a picture of what's on the inside and this is where this morning I want to read James chapter 3 it's lengthy but it's 18 verses I want to read in context and James is writing the church of Jerusalem and he says my brethren be not many masters knowing 
that we shall receive the greater condemnation. For in many things we offend all. If any man offend not in word, the same is a perfect man, and able also to bridle the whole body. Behold, we put bits in the horse's mouth, that they may obey us, and we turn about the whole body. Behold also the ships, which though they be so great, and are driven of fierce winds, yet are they turned about with a very small helm, whithersoever the governor listeth. Even so the tongue is a little member, and boasteth great things. Behold, how great a matter a little fire kindleth. And the tongue is a fire, a world of iniquity. So is the tongue among our members, that it defileth the whole body, setting on fire the course of nature. And it is set on fire of hell. For every kind of beast, and of birds, and of serpents, and of things in the sea is tamed, and hath been tamed of mankind. But the tongue can no man tame, it is an unruly evil, full of deadly poisons. Therewith bless we God, even the Father, therewith we curse we men, which are made after the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceedeth blessings and cursings. My brethren, these things ought not so to be. Doth a fountain send forth a same place sweet water and bitter? Can the fig tree, my brethren, bear olive berries? either a vine figs, so can no fountain both yield salt water and fresh. Who is a wise man, and endureth with knowledge among you? Let him show out a good conversation, his works with meekness of wisdom. But if we, but if ye have bitter envy and in strife in your hearts, glory not, and lie not against the truth. This wisdom descendeth not from above, but is earthly, sensual, and devilish. For where envy and strife is, there is conclusion, and every or confusion, excuse me, and every evil work. But the wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be in your house this morning. (coughs) This morning as we bring forth the bread of life, help us to think before we speak, whether on the street, in the house of God, or behind our computer. Lord, our fingers do our talking for us, but it's in our thoughts. And out of the thoughts and out of the heart, could proceed a good water or salty water. It could turn away or it could bring forth. Lord, help us to be a light of Calvary everywhere we go. Use this message to challenge us, to remind us about we are childlike in the faith of Jesus Christ. And yet we're created in His image, in the similitude of God. And may we reflect that in everything that we do at home or out in the workplace or in the house of God. Use me, I pray, for thy honor and thy glory. In Jesus' precious name, amen. Facebook and Twitter and Instagram, Snapchat, and the rest are a lot of fun. And a great way to connect with friends. But they're also, as I experienced, even back in the AOL days, remember those? And kind of, it's kind of tricky because they're also full of people that are angry. They're bitter. People are crawling across the internet looking for any person or Christian to insult. It's amazing how many people use their computer to attack people today. But I find it's kind of odd that they would never come to your face and say it. But behind that screen, they are Superman. They can bring out everybody's dirt. They can bring, you know what I I don't like about the internet? How people are so quick to start digging up dirt like they're perfect. Everybody has dirt. Everybody's got skeletons in the closets. Everybody's got a past that we, if we were now older, look back and say, if I was 20 again, how many in the sanctuary would say, I would never say that because my youth was perfect. No, 
I look back and said, man, if I was 20 again, there was a lot of wrongs I would make right. But that's how we learn. That's why as parents, we teach our kids from our mistakes and say, listen, don't make this mistake. But social media, everybody feels strong and, uh, and empowered to bring everybody's dirt out. And yet, I don't want any more dirt. That's why I don't watch news a lot. I don't watch TV a lot in that sense. I want to sit down. I want to unwind and not get aggravated because all they have is bad, 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 bad. Show some good. I know there's still good in our country, but why dwell on the negative? Not every one of the 33 million Canadians is negative, but you sure picture our country as negative. Not everybody in North America and the United States is negative. There's 399 million people. Why is Europe all pictured? There are still good people. My wife and I are communicating with people in Europe. There is still some good, but we focus on the negative. And this is where as Christians, we see the people like fishermen trolling for bass. And sometimes we take the bait. Amen. And in order to hook it, you have to start an argument. And you know you can't win. They aren't interested in your reasonable apologetics. They will spite your offer of love. Trolls will eat up your time and drive you to anger. And you will never move from their hearts. Don't take the bait. One of the greatest things I see on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and things as a pastor, but as a Christian, is the appalling speech. And people, and I'm very careful on who I accept as my friends. Most of them are Christians. Well, in name. And some of the mimes they post, I have to hide a lot of them. I'm like, why would a Christian post mimes like that? Why would a Christian put a thumbs up on something that is against Scripture? Why would a Christian even promote that? You know, I see it and I just like pass on. Don't, I'm not going to even chuckle at it. I'm not going to go on because I know there's some people that are connected with Christ, quote unquote, that post things that I'm appalled that they would post. And if I was their pastor, I would be personal messaging them and saying, what are you thinking? But I'm not their pastor. And this is where I want to ask the first question when we do a social media checklist in our think, is our, ready for this, speech Christ correct? Now, not my correct, because my speech sometimes is different than Christ. But is our speech Christ correct on Facebook, social media? Because social media is rampant with cursing, gossiping, bullying, pessimism, complaining. Instead of conforming to this world, as the Bible says, be a light. Use your words to build people up. And that's when you think, what is the first one? Is it true? It's what you're going to say. Why? The Bible says in Luke, it says the word of God is going to set you free. Amen? The truth shall set you free. What is truth? What do we base everything on? The word of God. It's going to set us free. So when we think about it, is the, what you're going to post, is it going to be helpful to someone? I love those people that pulls, post those things about how to build things or how to cook things. I've done several things off Facebook that someone says, how to build a fire pit. Well, that's pretty good. I can do that. So I go to Home Depot and I get all the materials and I build a fire pit. I like helpful things like that. I go to YouTube when I can't fix my car and I sit down for a minute and I say, there's got to be a way I don't have to pay a mechanic 90 bucks an hour. And I sit down on YouTube and I figure it out until I can do it. There are some helpful things, but there's also some trash. Know our weaknesses, folks. And be on guard when someone posts something that pushes one of our buttons, scroll on. Don't acknowledge it. You've had those people in school. You've had the people in your past. My brothers knew how to push my buttons. And they did it out of spite. They knew what got, I won't say my nickname, but anyway, they knew what got me mad. And one of it was, I'll tell you, I have to be honest. You know, that old nursery rhyme, Georgie Porgy Puddin' Pie, Kiss the Girls Many Rhymes, it was Gordy Porgy Puddin' Pie. So they would hit that all the time. And when you're a young little kid, you don't like girls. They got cooties. They're eh. 
And so they would pester me. They would push my buttons. They would know how to do it. And being the youngest, you had a lot of buttons to push. First of all, you felt you're inferior. You felt you're all this. You had, and, and this is what I had to overcome. But Facebook is great for people pushing buttons, isn't it? Because they don't have to see you. They don't have to be man up or woman up and look at your face and say, I don't like you. I wish those days were back. Don't you? Scrolling through Facebook and other types of social media can be like navigating through a minefield. <laughs> for many, cursing is just a means of communicating and it's hard not to notice. Those of us striving to live God's way of life must clean up the words that we say are right. Turn with me to Proverbs chapter 8. Solomon, the wisest man, except when it came to women. Proverbs chapter 8 and verse 13. Solomon writes this. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil, pride, and arrogancy, and the evil way and the froward mouth do I hate. The froward mouth. The ones that just speak. The ones that never put their mind in gear and they just blah. He says, though we may know, uh, though we may know we personally should not curse or use profanity, we may think that it does not apply to what we like or share on social media. Is that true? I want you to see too many Christians are guilty of wanting to sound close to the world. And many of us have come out of the world due to salvation, but the world has not come out of us. And I say that I personally don't know many people in here that does this, but I'm just saying in general, this is what I'm seeing from my 200 and something friends on Facebook. And I want to help you as a church not to fall in the same mistakes because I want to take the word of God this morning and help you to be able to keep your testimony clean in the house of God out of the house of God, but most of all on the internet. But here's, you may not be guilty of this, but maybe this would be a growing experience for all of us. Here are some examples of some serious words that violate Scripture and injure God Almighty. I'm going to give everybody the benefit of the doubt that you've never heard this. And I pray that we never do this. But the very first one was a lady I've known for a while, and I know a lot of people on Facebook, but this lady in particular posted this. And she says, why can't people just thank Chelsea for standing up to Barron and the children of our country without bringing his mom and dad, Bernie and Trump and other unrelated things in the conversation? Blank. It's embarrassing. This message is about standing up for our children no matter what party belongs to. I agree. No one should bully anybody, whoever they are, because of their parents. But the word she uses there really strikes a chord in my heart. Can anybody guess what that's short of? That is the slang word for Jesus. So what does the Bible say? Look in the next screen, please. There we go. In 1920s, Jesus became Jesus. Or G-E-E. -E, whatever you want to do. But the word of God says, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Thou shalt not take the Lord. Now, he said he's not going to hold you guiltless. This is one of the Ten Commandments. There is a lot more, and I'm seeing this. This is the conformity of Christian cursing. Now, let me read something to you that I found completely disturbing. This is from a regular Baptist youth minister. I have actually spearheaded a movement to provide a list of appropriate Christian cuss words for the vast majority of the religious populace who are just not ready to try the real words and succeed or don't want to say the real ones. How many youth pastors have to lose their jobs before we change the system? Thus, I've actually requested from my Facebook and Twitter followers that they submit their favorite words of this persuasion. And I received over 10,000 replies from you freaks. This is from his blog. 
So with a little help with my friends, I have compiled a list of top 100 Christian cuss words that will suffice to help you express yourselves in a Christian way, yet not develop too much of a negative testimony while doing so. The best method is to read this as fast as possible out loud in order to really gain a free flow and discover which one of these works best for you. I thought, wow, why do we want to emulate the world? Why do we want to have a Christian cuss word when every idle word is recorded by God Almighty and a youth pastor to help so that they won't have a negative impact on their testimony? Or not as much. Really? I thought a youth pastor is supposed to emulate Christ. I thought a youth pastor or a pastor is supposed to teach the people in all godliness. Amen? And here he is promoting, hey, give me 10,000. And the list was long. And everything was so close. And people didn't have to be rock science to figure out what they're saying. And this is where, when we look this morning, I want to help us not to fall in that trap. The devil says, hey, you can walk in my world too. No, we're in the world, but we're not of the world. So how are we to reach people for trying to get as close as they can? That's called ecumenicalism. That's called trying, how does the world says, be separate, be holy. Come out from among them. You're a new creature in Christ. So is all of that a lie? If we're to be different, and yet Facebook is a post of things that I cannot believe. Uh, there's one, I don't know if you can find it, Zach, the one where it has a street sign or the you know, little yard sign. They, uh, we were looking at something and this popped up. And, um, well, that's not it. And, uh, but on the uh, post there was a little, fo- someone said, they just did the, there we go. I was in my kitchen cleaning when suddenly I realized... OMG, I'm late for Facebook. You know what that means? Oh my God. You're taking his name in vain. So when you say OMG, you're basically not bold enough to say, oh my God. And really, I've had people say this and I said, really, what has he done for you? And they're like, well, I didn't mean that. Well, I know. It's a euthanism. And euthanism is a oath. An oath is, to, is an actual curse word. In the old days, oath was, he said an oath. It wasn't an oath, I swear, to <laughs> tell the whole truth. Nothing but it wasn't that. It was an oath was the form, the English word for cursing. And so late in the early 20s, and some of these go back to the 1700s, to where people started feeling confident to take the Lord's name in vain. What happened? We lost our reverence for God Almighty. Proverbs 30 verse 9 said, Lest I be full and deny thee, and say, Who is the Lord? Lest I be poor and steal, and take thy name of my God in vain. Be careful on how. And this is a surprise. Why are we taking God's name as a surprise? As a, why can you say, and I realized, wow. You know, if you want to use, if you have to use an idle word, just do wow, or Oh my, or I don't know, but take God's name in vain? Be careful. The Bible says a lot about taking the Lord's name in so lightly and loosely, but he also talks about irreverently. Deuteronomy chapter 5, verse 11, he stipulates again, Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. It needs to be understood that cursing can also be included in any verbal expression of a word, that it may not necessarily be considered a traditional curse word. This means that understanding of cursing needs to be expanded to not only include culturally and socially acceptable words, but any word that is deemed another by an individual or express extreme dissatisfaction with a particular situation, especially when the dissatisfaction is directed toward our God. Does God really care about what happens on Facebook, that I was cleaning my kitchen. Now, this was posted by a lady that I love very dearly that has taught Sunday school. Her father impacted my father's life greatly, and this is what she posted. And they just don't think. And I wanted to post, and I said, but ma'am, 
Is Facebook that important that you just cursed the Lord's name? I know it's a mime, but be careful. She didn't write it, but she posted it. And as we go on, I want you to see the next screen. I want you to see some different words that I've compiled from the uh, Merriam-Webster Dictionary. And it shows the different words that I see frequently used by Christians on social media, which it is definitely, the rest of them didn't come out, did it? For some reason, it didn't uh, work. That was uh, apologetic. But it talks about different words that we're talking about here. And one of it, we just covered G's. And the other one was, of all things, gosh. Remember in the 1950s, that became a new term? And uh, what was it? Um, Opie used it all the time. And Andy Griffith. And then little, uh, little Beaver, uh, Leave it to Beaver, started using it. And that was the first slide. But do you realize the word gosh started being used in 1757 as a euphemism for those that did not feel appropriate taking the Lord's name in vain. Well, aren't you doing the same thing? So they've shortened it. They've slanged it. And there we go. An oath, a profane or offensive expression used to express anger or other strong emotions. And there's a synonym, swear word, profanity, explanative, four-letter word, dirty word, obscenity, vulgarity, curse. But look at the last one, blasphemy. And I thought, what are we doing to the Lord when we say this? Scripture has much to say about how Christians ought to use their tongues. Jesus specifically taught that what comes out of a man's mouth is evidence of what's in the heart. Luke chapter 6 and verse 45 tells us, Luke 6, 45 A good man out of the good treasure of his heart bringeth forth that which is good. And an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart bringeth forth which is evil. For of the abundance of the heart his mouth speaketh. When we take the Lord's name in vain, does it really mean we don't, re well, it means exactly this in my opinion, we don't revere him enough. If we think that lightly of him to use it as a euphemism, it's habit a lot of times. We've been in ground. But you know what? Bad habits need to break too. I've got bad habits that I've had to break all the time. But that's one we ought to really strive to break because of anything, you're breaking the Ten Commandments. One of the Ten Commandments, taking the Lord's name in vain. And that is a serious penalty. He will not hold you guiltless. Then if we regard that in our heart, you know what Proverbs or Psalms 66 tells us? He said he will not hear our prayers. There's an important reason why we should be careful what we speak because our prayers are important. We have sick people in church. We've got family members we want to see saved. We've got family members that need jobs. We've got family members that need things. And if our prayers are hindered by a simple oops, you know what the oops is? Sin. But it's a high sin because it's taken the Lord's name in vain. Christians are often guilty of substituting more culturally acceptable words in place of an unacceptable words to describe their dissatisfaction with the situation or even a reference to an individual. These are called euphemisms and cannot be considered justified alternatives because a Christian should never show their dissatisfaction of the situation because it may be the situation the Lord has you in for a reason. That hit me when I read that blog part. God may have, God may had me. I know the last few months God has had me where he wanted me. With vehicle situation, with home situation, with things don't. He wanted me to teach on reliance. He wanted me to learn reliance so I can teach it properly. How can I teach something I've never learned myself? You know, some of the greatest teachers are the ones that have already been there. That experience life's problems. I've seen many times preachers that say, by the God's grace, I've never experienced anything. I was saved as a child and praise the Lord. But sometimes it's hard for that type of preacher to experience to the drug addict, to the drunkard, to the ones that are having addictions they can't cut. Why? 
they don't know what it's really like to be snatched by the devil and held in a habit. God has us, each one of us, for a different situation. And I thank the Lord that God's grace kept them from some of the things that I experienced. But also, it's been a teaching experience, especially for teenagers, for myself, to say, listen, I've been there. You don't want to live with the memories afterwards. Paul wrote in Ephesians 4.29, he says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. John MacArthur has written of this verse, and he said, the word corruption refers to that which is foul or rotten, such as a spoiled fruit or putrid meat. Foul language of any sort should never pass a Christian's lip because it's totally out of character with his new life in Christ. The final portion of the verse often offers a worthy use of our tongue. And it talks about our tongue is there for edification. Our tongue is there for encouragement. Once again, think. Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it kind? These are things, when you think about what Christ did, I don't see Christ going around just attacking people. He attacked the religious people. But he did not attack the average person because he didn't believe the way they did. Even the disciples, remember when they came running to him in the book of Matthew and says, Lord, these guys over here are doing miracles in your name, but they're not of us. Kill them. Chastise them. Do whatever you need to do. They're not our group. And the Lord looks at him. I can see the Lord just kind of like, really? They're not against me. And if they're not against me, they're for me, so leave them be. And that's the case. So many times we're like, well, they're not like us. Well, praise the Lord, they're not like us. Maybe they're not crazy like we are. But this is where we think, oh, well, they're not, well really? I didn't see Thomas. I can see him in the boat. Well, According to the geometry, Peter, you're too fat to walk on water. You know, Peter, what are you thinking? And I can see Simon the Zealot. Yeah, there's one less Roman sympathizer. You know, you think about They were a mixed bag of people God chose. You had a tax collector. You had a zealot. You had the doubter. You had some fishermen. You had this person. And some people God doesn't even tell. What. We don't know what Nathaniel was. But you can imagine they were a mixed bag of people. God didn't choose everyone tax collector or everyone a zealot or everyone a fisherman. God chose each individual one. And everyone gave their life for Jesus Christ as a martyr, saved John, and they tried. In all parts of the world. Do you realize Thomas died in India? Was burned at the stake? In India. But wait a minute, he's a Jew. How did he get to India? Go ye into all the world. We see several of them died, including John, died in Turkey. Nowhere near their homeland, never got back. But see, God used them. So when you think about the euphemisms, next screen, please. Here's a little bit before we move on, if you can get to that one. Before you post, we can post good things. And before you post, turn with me to Psalms 19, verse 14. Think of other words too. Many people are guilty of taking other euphemisms. Just look them up. You think about any one version of Christ. People say Jesus blank Christ all the time. I don't know where H comes in or anything else. Or people say golly, gosh, gee, geez. All of those are euphemisms of God. They also say heck or H-E double hockey sticks. You're still saying hell. Why? Why take in religious words as a slang? Do you realize when somebody says bloody, they're referring to Bloody Mary? You, you, you look at all these things, look them up. If you're not sure about them, go to the dictionary, put them in there, and you'll find a lot of slangs has to do with people that says something about this. Be careful. And when you think about one that caught me off guard the other day, 
when we say, oh my word, you know what it's referring to? The word. And I thought, wow. And it really makes you think because you grow up doing some of these things and I'm like, wow. Oh, what can I say? And the word of God tells me, maybe I don't need to say it. Maybe I need to be careful because the least I want to do is offend the Lord. I'm going to spend all eternity at his feet. Because I'm going to give an account. Psalms 19 and verse 14. Before we post, let's pray this. Look what David writes. A beautiful chapter. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength and my redeemer. Think before we post. Do people see the light of Christ in you based on what you post? Do you see the light of Christ and based on what you post? Social media networks present a unique opportunity to let your light shine before others and to show them the hope you have in Jesus Christ. When you think about your post, I was able a couple weeks ago to be able to post some things to some friends that lost a loved one. And I used some scripture. It's great to be able to post some things. As well as you think about also Pastor Cook, a good friend of ours, he's preached here in the pulpit every morning. Pastor Wynn, every morning, posts something from the book of Proverbs. Pastor Cook posts a devotional. That's excellent. We can do post verses, post things, encouragement. Somebody posted a verse the other day, and it was the exact verse I needed to see. It was one that I needed for that day. And you never know if you do it, Who's watching? Who's seeing? And we could be the light of Calvary. Don't forget the awesome opportunity you have to proclaim to the world the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. You know what God likes? God likes righteousness or right ways. When he puts a thumbs up, would he put a thumb up on our righteous post? If God were a Facebook user, Would he approve of the articles you just posted? Would he and Jesus Christ like the same mimes you just liked? King David gave us a look into what God likes. Turn with me to Psalm. You're right there. Go over to chapter, or Psalm 5, excuse me, not a chapter. Psalm 5 and verse 12. For thou, Lord... Wilt bless the righteous with favor? Wilt thou compass him as with a shield? Wilt bless the righteous? He will surround us as a shield. Jesus Christ also pointed out the importance of righteousness to God in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. In Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6, he tells us, Blessed are they which do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Have you ever stopped and considered what righteousness means? It sounds like a fancy theological word. But if God blesses the righteous, wouldn't we want to strive for that blessing? Wouldn't we want to take time to say, Lord, I want the blessings of you upon my life. But remember, Achan's sin hindered all of Israel. One man's sin entered in the world back at the beginning of time, our time it is, not God's, and death came upon all. So if Adam fell and Achan fell and both affected the congregation of the world, wouldn't, if I fell, affect your blessings as well? Same way with husband and wife. If I'm sinning, God's not going to bless my wife because he's ultimately going to bless me. I've experienced that. But because why? We are one. You know what the Bible says? We are many members, but one body. So we're, if your toe, I, none of you have ever done this, I know that. But I have a habit of kicking my bed toe on the poster bed of my bed. And for some reason, I should have no nerves in my toe by now. 
But every morning I seem to find it before I reach my glasses. If you see out of my glasses, they're bad. And they're real bad now because I have to admit I have to get bifocals. <coughs> so that means I'm getting old. But every morning it seems like I have to be careful. I should know where that bed's bare. It's been there for 12 years. It has not moved. But for some reason my toe finds it almost every morning. And it's like, oh, but you know what's amazing? It hits down here, but all of a sudden it hurts up here. And then my leg hurts, and the pain goes up. Isn't that the same way with the body? When you have a cold, it is affecting your lungs, but your whole body feels blah. You have a fever, you have a headache, and it affects your whole body. That's how sin is. Sin attacks the whole body. And so when we stop and think what righteousness is, if God blesses the righteous, wouldn't we want to strive for that blessing? And if it blesses us, then that means it's going to be a trickle effect. We're going to be a blessing to those around us. The Bible tells us what righteousness is. Psalm 119, Psalm 119, verse 72. Or 172, excuse me. My tongue shall speak of thy word, for all thy commandments are righteousness. Clearly, it is not only about thinking what is right, it's also about doing what is right. In other words, righteousness is the application of right ways. Furthermore, if we like, we're like Abraham, faithfully to do what God commands, James chapter 2 says his actions, his righteousness, was a, or his actions, his works, was accounted to him for righteousness. Does your social media help you renew your mind in God's truth? The Bible tells us also, do not be not conformed to this world. But what does he say? But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. If you get on Facebook and all it does is rile you, maybe you need to cancel your account or get new friends, one of the two. And sometimes I've had to cancel some friends. Don't be offended to walk away from some people that are not exemplifying Christ. If you had a friend that always found the negativity, beautiful sunshine, yeah, it's too warm. Too cold, do this, do that. No matter what you do, you bring them a nice five-course meal, if there is such a thing, and you lay it before them and says, Boy, this bun's hard. I got a knuckle sandwich for you. Or, or you, turkey meat's a little dry. Well, go fix it yourself. I learned that quickly. Never tell my wife her meal was bad. Or I was cooking myself. But you know, you have those friends that are always negative. Get rid of them. Really. Life is too short to feed on negativity. I'm a half full type of guy. But I know some people are half empty. I like to look, you know, there's always a positive side. But you got to find it sometimes. You got to dig for it. It's like a gold nugget. And you know, not always do you win. You know, I can be pretty negative at times too. But sometimes at that time, I just want to walk away because I don't want to affect you as well. I want to enjoy that thought too. God can use the little moments we give to him throughout our day to grow us including some time on social media, like the verse, like I was reading that from Pastor Cook. Let me give you an example. Do you know that Jesus is the only way to be saved? And he goes on, he says, that means that nothing else can save you. Please understand, it's not Mary, not Baptist, not communion, not beating prayer, not any other man telling you your sins are forgiven. Only Jesus can save you. You know, it's great. I posted that to a friend of mine that struggles with religion. We talked about it in Sunday school. And I gave them. I didn't have to write that. I just reposted it and sent it to him and let him know that, hey, it's by the name of Jesus Christ. God can use those moments. I have sought to develop the discipline to stop and read scriptures whenever I see it. Why? To make sure it's posted in context. Boy, there's a lot of scriptures that is like a hermeneutical contortionist. They're twisted all over place and it's like, wait a minute. Where did you get that from? How did that verse say that? As I was preparing the message, I began reading just a few verses in James chapter 3, and I realized 
we need to read it in context 1 through 18 to help us understand what God wants from us. Why? Because everything should be posted as true and as accurate, especially when it's dealing with the Word of God. It does have an eternal, eternal importance. Are you seeking to glorify God through your social media? Turn with me to 1 Corinthians 10 and 31. Ought to be posted on our screen of our computer. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Whatever we do, whether it's to our family, to our neighbors, to our church family, or on the internet, do all to the glory of God. Just like you saw that screen, we'll go back to it in a minute. Think. Think about everything we do. Realize people are either one push away from being saved or one push away from not being saved. And the devil can use the simplest thing. You could be posting a joke, but it's poking fun at a person or a nationality or this, and that's all it takes to offend them. Or a sin or this or that. Be careful. Pray about what we're going to do. A well-known mime has made its way around social media. And it's the message is important for Christians to remember. Think before you post it. The foundational question, are you seeking to glorify God? Can be addressed to any situation in life because we are created to glorify God. Isaiah 43, for the sake of time, I cannot read it. But Isaiah 43, 7 says that we are created to give glory to God Almighty. When we stray from our life's God-given purpose, we quickly fall away from where God wants us to be. God just doesn't like the world. He loves the world. And His love is so much more than we can ever imagine, according to John 3.16. God wants us to follow His instructions in every aspect of our life. God wrote the laws that guide us to happiness. God loves us. To be striving for righteousness in our life. Psalms 11 verse 7. God loves to see human beings who show respect and love for one another. John 13, 35. 1 John 4, 20 to 21. James 2, 8. What better way to show that we love Him than by doing what, we instru- what He instructs us to do. John 14, 15. We want people to like us. We especially want God to like us. And if we want God to love us, we should be doing what He likes. Before we post, may we pray Psalms 19. And may we think, is it true? Is it helpful? Is it inspiring? Is it necessary? Is it kind? May everything we do be Christ correct. May our words, may our actions... And anything we do, may it glorify our God in heaven. May it bring, as Matthew chapter 5 says, that your works may be seen. That it be glorify your Father in heaven. That's the Horton version. Bad when you get old. But you get the picture. Matthew chapter 5 says this. We're the light. We're the salt. And if our salt lose the savor, what good's it? If our light goes out, what good's it? Be careful. I've heard lost people say, I don't understand. If you hold your God so highly, why do you guys shorten the curse word for him? That's a good good, good, good question. Why do you guys shorten it? You're still taking his name in vain. It should not be ever coming from our mouths as a child of God, using his name as a euphemism. What has He done for us? Well, He's only given us life on the cross of Calvary for us. He's only given us a home in heaven. He's only given us grace and mercy and pardon for our sins. He's not a surprise word. He's not a slang word. 
He's a holy, righteous, reverent God that love the world. God's given us media. And I thank the Lord for what He's already done. I've heard all the way from Georgia to Texas to England. People are already watching our videos online. It's amazing. We've just had them up two weeks, three weeks maybe. And it's amazing. My mom's testimony has already been shared multiple of times across the internet. I don't know what impact it's going to be, but we're going to put good content on the internet. We're going to put content that glorifies God in everything that we do. Because I want the world to be reached. The third country for downloading the messages of Community Baptist Church is Russia. The fourth country, believe it or not, Number one is Canada. Number two is the United States. Number three is Russia. Number four is Israel. We had over 1.8 gigabytes of downloads from Community Baptist Church in Israel last month. Israel. What's God doing? I don't know. But may it be a revival for around this country. We may never be bigger than this. But the world's our platform. And we're going to make sure that we are doing what God would have to do us. Because I want the world to be blessed because we are doing what's right. I want the world to know that Jesus Christ is alive. And we, as this family, thinks before we post. We post only things that are true, only things that are helpful, inspiring, necessary, and kind in the image and likeness and similitude of our God so that we can impact people around the world. May God help us. Heavenly Father, thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Thank you for helping us to learn to be kind, inspiring, helpful, true, to watching what we say, watching what we do, how we react, Lord, help us not to be caught like a bass. Help us not to be trolled into arguments to where our testimony is ruined. But help us to be kind and thoughtful. And Lord, we ask you that you'd help us most of all to guard our lips, guard our hearts, that we may not fall into the devil's traps and dishonor our Lord, dishonor the Word, dishonor the Holy Spirit in everything that we do. May it bring honor and glory to you for you are our shield. May we walk in right ways before you. Lord, use this time of reflection and our invitation to open our hearts to remind us if we have sinned against you. Help us to be able to say, Lord, Forgive me. I want your blessings to be upon my life and upon my church family and upon my family. And if I have wronged you by belittling your holy name, please forgive me. If I have pushed Christians away on Facebook for belittling them, for believing different, thinking different, if I have pushed sinners away, saying they're unworthy of my Savior's love, forgive us. Help us, Lord, to be mindful. And as this Bible says, let this mind be in you which was in Christ Jesus. A humble mind. A meek mind. In Jesus' precious name, amen.